Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Happy Wednesday. We're halfway there. Can I just say three days until I take my girls to see Stevie Nicks? I cannot wait. I'm so excited. All right, so real quick, big thank you to Michelle and Lydia for your donations. I really appreciate that. And music fact of the day, the most viewed TV concert ever was the original Live Aid in London in 1985. That was held to raise money for the famine in Ethiopia. And among the performers, David Bowie, U2, the Dire Straits, Elton John, Paul McCartney, Phil Collins, and my personal favorite performance ever of Live Aid, Queen. They brought the house down. Okay, so merch store back up and running. It's in all the links on all the social media and in the podcast description. So I've got a couple of new things, <clears throat> new things in there. Excuse me. My lung just kind of came up and was like, hello. Uh, but check this out. So I'm not done yet. I'm, I've, I've found I like designing shirts, but check this out. Since I do music, I figure I got to have one music shirt in there. So I'm going to show you this. I'm kind of thinking about putting this on there, but I'm not sure about the colors of the boom box yet. It's a lot of purple, but anyway, so I'm having fun doing that. So check it out. I really tried to find like the most cost effective way to do it for you guys. That's not just outrageously expensive so i hope i know a lot of people have ordered so thank you one thing to note when you get your merchandise they seem to be running a tad big but i found once you wash them they kind of shrink down to around the size that you originally ordered maybe a tiny bit bigger but not anything crazy i thought the sweatshirt i ordered looked like a blanket but it really once you dry it it definitely uh, shrinks up a bit. So thank you guys for all your support. We got a ton of new listeners and uh, just want to again say hello to everybody. So yeah, let's get started. So we ended the day yesterday with Michael Kasar, who is a forensic accountant for BCI. So in total, he presented 17 different bank accounts and 11 credit cards and loans that the Wagners had, which was often mingled together. And throughout the investigation, though, he looked at another 30 to 50 accounts for them, tens of thousands of pages, he said. And the documents from Amazon, Amazon alone were just enormous. So... There were, he went through a lot of stuff today and I'm really just going to condense it because it's numbers and math makes my head hurt and it makes me want to punch somebody. So I'm just sort of pulling what's relevant from his testimony about the murders. There was a lot of stuff financially that wasn't, I think it just, the point of him testifying other than verifying purchases that were for the homemade silencers and things like that, it was more I think pointed to the fact that everything about this family was joint, which goes against the defense's stance that George knew nothing about these murders. I think that's really a lot of why a lot of these accounts came in that really had nothing to do with the murder. So, all right. So we're talking about one of Jake's cards. It was a solo card. He opened this account in 2013 and closed it in 2018. And this was the Bass Pro Shops. It was a Bank of America card. It was a credit card. So some purchases that he noted on March 27th of 2016, just a little less than a month before the murders. This was at a Bass Pro Shops in Cincinnati. He spent $184.77 for two boxes of 7.62 by 39 ammo with 40 rounds each and one SKS, a 30-round magazine. That's the 7.62 by 39 millimeter bullets. We know the SKS allegedly was what George was carrying the night of the murders. And so on George's Cabela's card, that was opened in 2013, closed in 2017. So we had that 
that brick house electronics charge on March 16th of 16. That was for the bug detector. And then March 21st, 2016, that was that overseas transaction, which they do believe was that signal jammer. And at the Waverly King, he spent $553.81 on April 13th, 2016. Among the purchases was a 3D flashlight. And so we know the flashlights are used to make homemade suppressors. Then April 18th, 2016, OK Auto Parts, he spent $90.20 for a Wix filter, heavy-duty spin-on fuel water separator. And then on April 27th, this is just after the murders, a few days, he spent $130.68 on a firearm. So there was a home equity loan for Peterson Road that was in Jake's name that was for repairs on the property. But they transfer payments to George's Cabela's credit card and Jake's Bass Pro card. He noticed a large amount of transactions between accounts over a period of three and a half years. Over $100,000 worth of financial transfers between the Wagners happened. And yesterday we talked about these things were pinging everywhere. Just they were moving money around. He said frequent transfers and sharing of funds shows they're working as a coordinated group. There was an objection to that, but the prosecution kind of reworded it and got it out. As far as shared expenses, he looked at vehicles. Jake and George purchased the vehicles for the family. None were in Billy or Angela's name. Groceries and general retail items, most of those were made on accounts by George and Jake. Utilities paid by George and Jake. He focused on this in a shared situation and said it tells how finances are working in the household. That was actually an objection that was sustained. And the names on the deed to Peterson were George and Jake. Jake, George, and Angela were more financially connected than they were with Billy. But Billy was most financially connected to mommy, Frederica. So some cars that they bought, George had a 2004 Chevy, Chevy Suburban, a 2007 Dodge S35. George and Tabitha co-signed on two vehicles. A the um, There was a 2000 Chevy 2500 and then also the Dodge S35. They were $17,000 each on November 14th of 2016, so this is after the murders, Geico paid George total loss insurance payout for a 2000 Chevy 2500 in the amount of $16,193. These people get more insurance payouts, y'all. Uh, they So on Cross, he mentions he was told to look for certain items by investigators. This guy totally did not hide the fact that he did not know much about guns. And so Nash said, if you flag some purchases, you're not saying that's evidence in this case. You were told that's something that could be important, right? And he says, well, KSAR says, it's evidence in the case, but it may or may not be relevant. So on March 7th, 2015, there was a muzzle brick bought. Why did you flag that? He said it was a firearm and it was re relevant. So they go down this list. Everything was purchased by Jake. I mean, really, it's, you know, we, we know that George bought that Captain America mask that was brought up yesterday. But the bait nets, which can be used to create brass catchers, purchased by Jake, put on his card. The 1911 purchase on February 26 from Tactical Innovations. That was a thread adapter for a Colt 1911 uh, he said that flagged your attention and he said yes who does that account belong to Jake so there was some Amazon purchases by Drill America and he was asked why he thought that was relevant he said he was told to look for any tools or equipment used for precision drilling that's going to come in later when our gun dude comes up that account belongs to who Jake Wagner more drill bits bought by Jake. He talks about the flashlight purchases on Jake's account, the high-quality plug tap, which is for silencers. Uh, that's Jake's account. 
hex dies used for suppressor brought by Jake. And then there was a maglite D cell solvent trap combo thread adapter, Jake. So they just really point out that Jake bought pretty much everything that was used to build these homemade silencers. So you were asked about people operating as a unit. Wouldn't we expect to see an account with everyone's name on it if that were the case? And he said, well, you could. Nash says, if we have a living arrangement and utilities are paid by certain people, did you see a sharing of expenses and transfers to others? And he said, yeah. So he gives the example, if Jake and George pay the utilities, maybe Angela transfers a portion of that back to them. Nash hands him the auto loan from First Stank Bank, and he asks, what is that car? He says, there were two. It was a 2000 Chevy 2500 and the other car. And so Nash talks about the OK Auto Parts purchase. It was a Wix filter and a water separator. And so he points out on the receipt that at the very top, it specifies that it's for a 2000 Chevy 2500, although the, the Wix filter and all that can be used to make the homemade suppressors. So he says, you don't have all the financial records of George. Of course not. And so Nash lists accounts that the witness didn't have, like Snap-on Auto Parts credit accounts. He had several that Nash didn't find. He gets into the insurance payouts, Nash does. Uh, February 2016, there was a $40,000 deposit. It was put into George and Angela's account. And Nash asks, this was a good catch by the defense, actually, two times. He says, um, is there a date of birth on that? And so he looks, the witness looks, and he says, June 4th, 1971, which would be Billy Wagner and not their client, George. Good catch. And so he has him look at the deposit slip for the $40,000, and the person making the deposit is Billy and not George. So it's, you know, in the grand scheme of a murder of eight, it doesn't make a difference, but the defense has got to call out anything that's inconsistent, and they did catch that. So the... Uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts, the Wix oil filter. You have the purchaser's George Wagner. He points out the bank account was actually Billy's. And they talked about taxes. Angela had minimal income, of course. And then he said, is it criminal that a son pay for his mom's expenses? And the witness says no. You can't say that just because someone's account was used that they actually purchased that. And he said no, which actually goes for the same thing with all these purchases they put on Jake. It doesn't necessarily mean that Jake bought all that stuff with his Bass Pro Shops card. So if I were Angela on Recross, I would have definitely brought that up. So on Recross, they bring up the GoFundMe by Jake after the murders for legal expenses to get custody of Sophia and Kazar was unaware of that. So the next witness was Special Agent Scheider. As we know, he was at all the searches on the properties, and nobody knew the Walther Colt 1911 was involved in the murders until July of 2017. The laptop they seized at the border was reviewed through the winter of 2017 into the spring of 2018 due to the extensive amount of information on that computer. Montana seized that laptop and it remained in their control until search warrants were obtained by BCI to get that and then additional search warrants were obtained to analyze it. So we go back to 260 Peterson. She mentions the conversations heard that week from the intercept warrants. And we know that there was some texting and some calling between the Wagners about these searches. They were very upset. He was provided with hourly, daily, sometimes um, um, minute-by-minute minute updates of what they were getting from the wiring room as far as communications. So the body wire has a short life, and they were put in the suburb and the Wagner, Wagners were traveling in. So they were back in Ohio for a short time, and when they left again for Alaska, Billy, Angela, and the kids were in the suburban, and Jake and George drove that truck up there with the trailers. So Billy, Angela, and the kids dropped the Suburban off in the state of Washington, and it was taken on a ferry over to Alaska. While it was in Washington waiting to be put on the ferry, they removed the devices from that car. 
So in 2018 on Peterson Road, there was a decision to search part of the property there. On some of the recordings, they noticed Angela kept inquiring about which barn they were digging behind. And she seemed really concerned. And they still hadn't recovered the murder weapons or the suppressors. So they wanted to go back to Peterson Road to do a little more in-depth search around the barn area. So they knew the new barn behind the residence was in different phases of construction during the investigation. And it was an area they really had not even touched yet. So the construction was also a reason they decided to search. With it being under different stages of construction, they worried the murder weapons were put maybe in the concrete that were in the poles in the ground. They were close. And they thought about tearing the barns down if needed, and they were actually given permission to do so. But he said the homeowner was actually, and I said this last night, I knew it, was very cooperative during all the searches. So June 14th and 15th, they searched. And the homeowner, as we know from yesterday, Dwayne was communicating with the Wagners. They had asked him to communicate with the Wagners about the searches. And that they call that tickling the wires, where you try to initiate conversation about the searches or anything where they can grab something. And I don't blame the dude at all. I mean, he knows at this point they're pretty solid suspects in the murder of eight people. So I'm sure he did not want to be number nine. So yeah, he he worked with BCI actually and sort of was fudging, you know, it may be why Jake could never get an answer about which barn, but they were never, um, they never told the homeowner that they didn't need a search warrant either. So they returned to Peterson to decide if the barn needed to be torn down in October of 2018. Now, remember, they were arrested, I think, November. So we're getting really close to the time where the Wagners were arrested. I'm going to do a screen recording of Billy getting arrested. That's the only footage that I've ever found of him. And uh, one thing I've learned about Billy during this whole trial so far is at first, you know, you see him come in the courtroom. He's big. He's kind of menacing. He looks mean as a snake. But Billy really seems like just a big wussy pushover. Um, like somebody said, all bark, no bite. So they removed a shell casing from the cistern earlier in 2018. So that was a little bit of an area of interest to them as well. They decided not to tear down the barn, but the floor of the barn was a dirt floor. So they really focused on the old main barn at that time. Initially, there was a smaller group that went out just to kind of look over things, but they decided to bring in more personnel and equipment. So the cistern in the old barn had not been thoroughly searched at that point, and it, they knew it needed to be done. So there was a well also that was close to the house, and he knew of the well with the clear water, but he was not aware of the cistern back in 2017 in that barn. So they decided to search that cistern, and it was a smaller operation that the media was not aware of, and that's when they brought in the dive team to go in. So on cross-exam, what's the name of the new homeowner? And it, he says, Dwayne, and I'm not going to say his last name, but he says, you're saying he consented to the searches. Did you have him sign a consent form? And uh, he says, I don't think we did. And then the defense says, you asked him to have conversation with the Wagners because you're looking for their reaction. And he said, very much so. So the defense, you're using him to further the investigation. And the defense says, did you monitor the conversations between him and the Wagners? And, you know, it wasn't his job. As the lead agent, are you aware if Jake and Angela set up a GoFundMe for $20,000 for legal fees for Sophia? He said, I was made aware through the media. The defense says, I'm asking what you saw. Now, I'm going to tell you, this dude gets super frustrated with the defense. He gives some funny looks to somebody that's sitting maybe right up front. He kind of, you know, does his eyes like, yeah, it's, and his face gets red. So he says, uh, I don't, he said, I don't know how I found out about that, essentially. And he said, your job is lead investigators to know everything that's important. Did you know? He said, I, as I just stated, I did not. 
And then the defense asks, what is this cistern? And he says, I don't know if it was used for livestock or manure. It was filled with black sludge. It's gross. I've got some pictures of that cistern there. And so on redirect, it says, was that communication with the homeowner? Was that just the 2017 search? And he says, yes. And then she says, you were asked about the GoFundMe. It was either seen in the media or a Facebook group. He said, uh, I was not aware through the computer. In other words, when they seized that computer, they didn't find any evidence of a GoFundMe being set up on that. You can set up on your phone. You can set it up anywhere. And the defense or the state said the homeowner had communication with Jake. This was for the 2017 search, not the 2018 search. They reiterated that. So Parker comes up on further cross and George was concerned about being sued by the current homeowner about destruction to the property. So the next witness was Lieutenant Brian White. He's been up plenty of times. And this was October 30th of 2018. That was the search with the barn with the cistern. We'll put that back up in a second. They found a cartridge case at the cistern, which prompted them further search of that cistern. So they asked the Franklin County Sheriff's Office dive team to assist. And they recovered an older grip of a D cell flashlight that was found immediately. It was kind of under some bricks. It, they there was a ton of bricks that they had filled that cistern with. And it was modified into something it wasn't originally made to be. So it needed to be investigated. It was sent to BCI and there was a serial number on the item. So they did some more investigation and found out it was a mag light flashlight and it had something inside of it. They had it x-rayed and found out it was two metal discs placed inside. They contacted the ATF lab to see if they would examine it further. And then they show a photo of the casing there on the left uh, that they found in the cistern. And then on the right is that flashlight handle that they found in the cistern. So what they did was eventually they pumped the sludge out of that cistern to make it easier for the divers. And on cross, uh, have you stayed involved in the case as far as updates? Cause remember Lieutenant White's gone now. He left uh, maybe a couple of years ago. He says, Yeah. And then he's asked, as far as the mag light found in the cistern, are you aware, Jake Wagner, there's an objection, sidebar, it's sustained. We didn't get there. The next witness is Sean Floyd. Um, he was the diver that went in the cistern. He said the water was knee to thigh depth since there were bricks in there. So they had to remove about 200 bricks to get to the cistern. They found wires, bottles, animal remains, and then they found the flashlight. They found the flashlight in the first half of the search under bricks. He said eventually he was fully submerged and that cistern was 15 feet deep. So they recall Special Agent Scheider. He used the serial number on that mag light to obtain the manufacturer date, which was January 13th, 2016. So we know that it was hidden after the murders let's not mince words here y'all he was asked about the amazon purchases of the light and makes clear it was bought by jake so the next witness is james barlow he usually testifies in federal court and i'm going to tell you guys this gets a little technical and i'm gonna do my best but this is all about making homemade silencers so this is his first time to testify in a state case normally he testifies in federal court and this dude knows his stuff. So he says, when you fire through a silencer, carbon and other stuff builds up on the inside. Usually you can disassemble it. And then they'll look at what's inside to decide what they've done to make this a silencer. So the, um, if they can't disassemble it, they'll take an x-ray and it shows you the interior. And they also use what they call a bore scope to look inside that barrel. And they can run that inside and take photos is really cool so he was talking about homeland security has an operation called silent night and it's an investigation that they do online where they try to bust people who are selling and buying silencers online without um 
with it without it being legal. Um, he said sometimes people think it's legal if it doesn't have the drill holes in it, but it's still illegal. Also, silencers were being imported from China, and the goal was just to stop that. So he said you can use a mag light to make a homemade silencer. And flashlights, you buy freeze plugs for um, that are made for a car engine. Sorry, my brain just went like whoop. You drill a hole and put it inside, and it becomes a baffle. So I'm going to put this up real quick. This is a baffle for a silencer. On the left, I believe, are professional legal ones you could buy. The one on the right is something that's illegally made. I don't know if it's illegal to make a baffle. I, I don't know, y'all. But anyways, that's a homemade one on the right, and it comes in. So you drill a hole and put it inside, and it becomes a baffle, which is, he says, the same as a muffler on a car or a lawnmower. It muffles the flow inside the tube. You can cap it after that. So you drill a hole in the front and attach it to the barrel, and you're done. You can also get a threaded adapter, which we know Jake got. The silencer cools the gases before it hits the atmosphere, and he gives the example of walking, and you come up to a set of stairs. You walk up, and it makes you slow down, and then when you get to the top, if you're healthy and not 45 with a bad knee, you go back to normal speed. But that's kind of how silencers work. So it slows things down inside the silencer, but once it comes out, if the silencer is built correctly, it goes at pretty much normal speed if everything's right. So when he got the remains of that flashlight, he got a report and said it was suspected to be components of a homemade silencer. And he reevaluated those findings. And he noticed a switch hole. And sometimes it's wrapped in duct tape to um, prevent gases from escaping. So this baffle, if it's not properly aligned when fired, it will distort the end and it causes the end of that to distort. So if you're on YouTube, the bottom picture or center, you see how that circle is warped a bit. So it just wasn't aligned perfectly. And they can tell that's a homemade silencer that that was fired because it's warped there. Um, it's hard to get it lined up most efficiently. You want the center hole to be as close to the diameter of the bullet, but you also want to slow the gases. So having a smaller hole is best. If the hole is bigger for wiggle room to accommodate your threader, the bullet is less likely to hit a baffle while being shot. He said it's hard to tell what caliber um, was, was fired out of this, but ultimately he said the hole is still formed but pushed out. So he said it's, if it's from a high-powered rifle, it will power on through that. He thinks this was a pistol caliber bullet that came out, possibly a 22, but it could be larger. If it's jacketed, it may hold together better. A lead projectile will make a bigger deformity and it will also potentially deform the bullet. So he did this x-ray on this and you, first of all, this thing was burned. He was able to see that just visually that the aluminum had melted down. And so on the photo, all the green is burnt up aluminum. And I've got some arrows there pointing to what he was talking about. So the bullet kind of bounced around in there after the trigger was pulled. The baffle strike, which is what they call it, caused the baffles to lay on their side. It shouldn't do that if it's properly put together. He used the scope to look inside. And so he was able to see the, um, oh, where's that picture? Hmm. I don't think that I put it on there, y'all. Well, sorry. Um, so 
he cleaned it up with a solvent and a brush, and he shows a comparison to a, a flashlight compared to what they found in the cistern. And as you can see, it's it's a mag light flashlight that was used. And he said you can find instructions for these online. It's totally illegal. And ultimately, he said these parts were bought and put together to make an illegal firearm silencer. He said under the law, this is illegal. He explains also how people try to skirt around it, but it's still illegal and they don't know it. You can use an oil filter to make a homemade silencer. You can get an adapter to the barrel to fit the oil filter on the end. He said these are fairly common. The bigger the expansion chamber, the better it works. So he compares it to a muffler on a semi truck and compare it to putting like a tiny muffler on a semi. So the bigger the barrel, the better. So they, he's asked about a suppressor regarding the stippling that's found on the skin in close proximity. And the particles, like we talked about when we first started this, this witness, the particles will be captured and retained inside. So it's not as much uh, stippling as a normal gun would without a homemade silencer on the end. A suppressor could make it harder also to determine the distance a shot was fired at. A suppressor could affect the accuracy in a lot of different ways. And he's asked about the Colt Imerex 1911-22 long rifle tip thread adapter Whew. with thread adapter, wait, with thread protector, thread adapter. And he said it's an adapter you can screw on the end of a gun to attach a silencer to. Jake bought one of those. So they go through all the purchases that... Uh, Jake made that were just parts for these homemade silencers. And that was pretty much the end of his, of the testimony for the day. So since this is a relatively shorter episode, I did find a couple of interviews with Jake after the murders before he was a suspect. But first I want to show you this picture. This was taken, I believe, April 30th. If you look on the left, you can see George's hair is really dark. I did some sleuthing on the Wayback Machine and found this picture from Defiance Farms from way back when, April 30th, uh, just a little over a week after the murders. Um, on Jake's Facebook, there is a picture of him and Sophie, May 9th of 2016, and someone commented, she is, and the child's face is blurred out for those of you not watching. She is such a mix between you and her mommy, and she looks just like both of you. Jake replied, I know some days she looks like a mini me, and other days a twin to her mom. It just makes me miss her more. Liar. Gosh, I don't know how they, how they live with themselves. Okay. So Jake gave an interview to the Cincinnati Inquirer, July 29th of 2016. It says, Jake Wagner still can't quite bring himself to tell his two-and-a-half-year-old daughter that her mommy is dead. It's the finality of the word that stops him. He worries about the toe-headed toddler's unpredictable reaction. There will be, he knows, so many questions. He is concerned, too, that she may become frightened. He knows there will come a day when he will tell Sophia that her mom, Hannah Roden, was shot and killed with seven of her extended family members on April 27th. He knows another day will arrive when he and she will make a trip to the cemetery where her mom is buried alongside two of her uncles and maternal grandparents. I've told her that mommy is with Jesus and we will see her again later, Wagner said. I don't know if she knows Hannah isn't coming back. I don't know if she understands. How could she? It says the investigation is now in its fourth month with no state of motive, nor suspects, and no arrest. And as the criminal case is moving along, so is the business of custody and estates. Neither is easy. This is the Wagner's new reality. Full-time single dad with mounting legal bills with a job that pays half of what he was making to ensure he is close to Sophia. But close still means the three-year-old makes a daily commute from Peebles to the, I'm sorry, the 23-year-old makes a daily commute from Peebles to Cincinnati, a two-and-a-half-hour daily drive. Wagner won custody of his little girl last month in Pike County, he said. And while the ruling was not unexpected, the legal bills were. This week, Wagner set up a GoFundMe account in an effort to defray the legal bills, other unexpected but associated costs. 
He didn't know about the website until his mother mentioned it to him. Conniving old witch. He said he didn't want to draw attention to himself or his daughter, but he also didn't see a way out of the debt he's incurred since the homicide. In Pike County, family clings to hope. These were not expenses I was supposed to have. I was just supposed to be able to spend time with her and give her a happy childhood. She's only two and a half years old. Wagner wrote on the page of the crowdfunding website. Sophia and I are just asking for enough to settle the fees that we acquired due to the horrific tragedy to her mommy. We want to get our lives back. We, he wrote, I hate seeing my daughter cry. Wagner set a fundraising goal of $20,000, but said his legal bills were not quite that high. But he added his legal bills were four times more than what he expected. The former over-the-road truck driver and train mechanic has maxed out his credit cards. He said he's paying his lawyer and what is left over after he pays his other bills every month. It hardly makes a dent. Hannah Roden and Wagner shared custody of Sophia, who was supposed to be with her mom that fateful Friday evening, he said. But Wagner picked her up a day earlier than normal. He said, I reckon we missed it by just hours. It's unclear if any family members have been able to see either Ruger or Kylie. Wagner knows that Sophia hasn't seen them since April 21st, but he's taken her to a play date with her cousin Brentley at a playground. She was at a family wedding this past weekend, and she recently visited her great grandmother, Geneva Roden, which put a rare smile on the 73-year-old matriarch's face. Dad and daughter are working to find a sense of normalcy and routine. There are the four-wheeler rides he takes her on to a nearby creek. She helps him in the barn with the animals. There are tea parties, nail polishing sessions, and Disney videos. On the night he makes it home before she drifts off to sleep, they read books together. Finding Nemo is her current favorite movie. When they are all done, she interlocks her little fingers and she prays. And Jake says, and I have her talk to her mom. Lord have mercy, y'all, in heaven. That's just horrible. Um, Jake also talked to the Gazette about Kylie Mae and Sophia. Jake Wagner, 23, says there's a 50-50 chance he's Kylie's father. He and Hannah Roden dated for nearly three years before they welcomed her half-sister, Sophia, now two and a half years old. If Wagner is her father, that would mean her half-sister would become her full sister. And there's nothing Wagner would like more, he said, fondly recalling how he pulled the tiny sock off of her little bitty foot shortly after she was born on April 17th. He was checking for a hammer index toe, a Wagner family trait. He's almost sure, he said, that he saw that bend and it's the hope he holds on to these days. But if he isn't Kylie's dad and the courts deem another man suitable to care for her, he will step aside at least partially. I'm not going to take her, Wagner said, but I want mandatory visitation in order to see her regularly. He wants to ensure she gets to know her toe-headed big sister who loves tea parties, getting her fingernails painted, swinging and playing on the extensive play areas Wagner has built at their house. It's a home where Wagner once hoped Hannah Roden would come back eventually, bringing Kylie. Regardless of what happens, Kylie and Sophia are now and forever will be at least half-sisters. The girls share a bond. They lost the same mommy. They need each other, said Wagner's mom, Angela. When they get old enough to understand, they will really need each other. The level of low... Um, Whew. Man, a lot of beaties to the max. They're oozing it, y'all. So, yeah, that dark hair picture, I was really happy to find that one. And then the one with Jake on Facebook. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. No, that's all the pictures, and that's all I have for you guys tonight. So maybe tomorrow we'll get into some more interesting testimony. They are still leaving a lot of things open-ended. But today really was just sort of that focus on the unit, everything, finances intermingled, cult-like, um, very strange family, y'all. I also have pulled some pictures of the interior of the house in Alaska. 
that I'll show tomorrow. And I'm still looking around on the Wayback Machine, going to old websites that they had or looking up usernames that they used to use and uh, finding a few things here and there. So um, throughout the course of the trial, I'll just pop some things up, maybe every episode that I find. And anyways, uh, so be back tomorrow. Got this one done early tonight. And I am hitting the sack soon. All right. You guys have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.